important to Extinction Rebellion. We're on day two of a two-week protest, um, Rupert, in cities uh, around the world, including here in London. The Prime Minister at a book launch last night described the protesters as bivouac crusties. Is that a fair comment? Well, you know, I'm feeling kind of bad. Here I am. I've got a tie on. Even Nigel doesn't have a tie. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I have to have a, a nose ring, according to the PM, to speak for exile. I don't think these are very seemly comments for a prime minister to be making. But, you know, I actually know Boris Johnson. I was at college with him at Oxford. And he's actually a lot smarter than he likes to let on. Uh, and so I've got a, a message for him. Uh, and the message is that this rebellion is about whether or not we have a future, whether or not our children have a future. And when I leave this studio, I will go and rejoin my fellow rebels right outside this building uh, on Millbank. Uh, and the police are arresting us right now. Uh, and if they come to take me away, I'm going to show them this, which is, these are my nieces. These are, my, these are the people that I'm doing this for. Poppy and Rosie. Poppy and Rosie, yeah, because I love them. How old are they? There, um, one of them is about 10 and the other is in her teens. And I'm doing this for them. And if more of us don't do this, we're not going to have a future. That's what it's about. And what I want to say to Boris is, I really want you to hear that. And if you let that land, I believe that you will start to change your mind and start to act accordingly. Can you do one thing for me, though, Rupert, when you do join? And, and this is really important. Um, and I crossed Westminster Bridge this morning and I saw... Uh, the demonstrators uh, there uh, camped out. St Thomas's Hospital is the other side. Please ensure that there is a path through for ambulances to get to uh, the hospital or fire brigade to get to burning buildings, whatever, yeah. because it is important. You know, the taxi drivers used to have a, a demonstration yeah. every Wednesday. They yeah. made sure that there were routes yeah. through. And so do we, Nigel. We make sure of that. Ambulances not with flashing the, lights. Not, not on uh, the bridge me, this morning. Excuse me. Ambulances with flashing lights are always let straight through. But let's remember, we are all in a awesome. burning building now, right? That's the situation that we're in. As Greta Thunberg says, I want you to act like our house is on fire, because it is. So that's why we're back on the streets, because after our rebellion in April, Parliament declared a climate and environment emergency. But what's actually been done? Where's right. the actual well, action? Is, Where is, the, actual the, is the disruption policy? that's been talked about legitimate? Well, I think that it's not so much a question of legitimacy because, of course, everybody has a right has a right to protest. But is but that level of disruption? some of the le yes? I think we've re we have reached a level where, uh, you know, as, as as Nigel mentioned, you know, patients are, from what I could make out, being denied access to hospitals. There were Extinction Rebellion protesters on TV saying that they would be essentially making the decision as to who was let through, and these people aren't medical experts. This is precisely the kind of behaviour, and I completely fully we let appreciate all ambulances with flashing lights through. I can just tell I'm you that's fact. All right, because they're all there with their Tense, Rupert. And on yeah, Westminster but there Bridge. There is always and, and a channel left open for no, there isn't. Like, we're going to move on. We're going, we are. Reason. We're going to move on because and otherwise and we're not going to have enough time to talk about the other issues. Talk about the bigger issues. Rupert, yeah, it's not just about. Rupert and Nigel. I'm talking about people in the back of ambulances, Rupert. That's Nigel. vitally and important. Nigel. And now I, we I, are. I, I, we are going to come back to it because I'm going to mention Jess's book, Truth to Power. One of the chapters is make a plan. Yeah. Do you think this lot have got a plan? It looks as if they have in terms of trying to raise mm. national awareness yeah. and trying to I, make a point to I the politicians. I don't just think that they have a plan. I think they have a well-executed plan that has worked and that uh, for lots and lots of voters, for the first time ever, actually, the environment is top of the agenda. I mean, largely because my, our children, a lot of the time, you show your nieces, my sons go on the demos and rallies. Uh, and have really taken on board this message. What I worry about with the Extinction Rebellion is how we turn that plan into practical action. And when Rupert says, what have you done since that? Well, we haven't done anything about anything in Parliament, pretty much no legislation has progressed. So I don't want you to feel too bad about uh, mm. that particular issue. But the reality is, is that where I live, most people are employed in the car industry and at the airport. And we have to we have to find a way to marry up Extinction Rebellion's hopes and dreams with the economic stability of those people so that we're on the same page. All right. And we need some proper solutions. Well, let's have a look at some... Well, about the economic immiseration going carbon... We're going to talk, we're going to talk no, no, about no, that no. in just a moment because Fake Ellie news. Price, our reporter, has looked at the action that would actually be needed to be zero carbon neutral. Um, there's some disagreement over when that should happen. Nigel's party says 2050. The Labour Party says 2030. You want, Rupert, 2025. Yeah. Um, let's have a look at some of the changes that would be needed to achieve those things.
it's, our it's aims a in a whole is to save the planet so i feel like realistic isn't really the question because we need to just it's either we do it or we don't we want businesses to be affected we want people to like be late to work so it causes disruption that the government can't really ignore they can't really ignore kids that are blocking roads People will need to cut down on dairy and meat, become vegan if possible, vegetarian if possible. Stopping using cars, using public transport and buses and walking instead, or using a bike is a great way to get around. Making sure like your home is well insulated so you're not like burning fossil fuel on um, heating when you don't need to or heating water. Like if you can put a jumper on or a hoodie, that's a great thing to do. There'll be a lot of things that the individual will have to do, but it will become, it will come as a result of like legislation that the government makes. Are you prepared to stop eating meat? Are you prepared to stop flying on aeroplanes, driving in cars? Well, I mean, I personally, I haven't cut all of those things out of my life yet because I think it's wrong to ask each individual to take total responsibility for that. But I think the change needs to come from the top down. OK, so those were the activists. But I guess the whole point is it needs to be all of us if anything's going to change. More than half the councils in the country have declared a climate emergency. They have here in Leeds. But there's a very big difference between saying... Climate emergency. Net zero. Climate emergency. Net zero target. And doing. We're using the waste heat from our uh, waste incinerator, putting super insulated pipes under the streets of Leeds at the moment, and that will bring that heat into Leeds so it provides cost-effective heat. They no longer need individual boilers, which reduces the carbon emissions. Better park and ride facilities so people don't have to drive all the way into the city centre. More cycle lanes in the city. It might be a leap in the dark for a small business to jump from a diesel van to an electric van, but we can lend them one for a couple of months. They can see whether the charging regime fits in with what they need to do. These seem like practical solutions, but are they going to be enough? They're going to make a difference, there's no doubt about that. But we know to um, reach where we want to be, there's going to have to be some fundamental changes around consumption, around the way people live their lives. We're looking at uh, ways we can finance things, but actually to get that step change, we need a lot more money. OK, we're back in London. We're at the London School of Economics and we're here to meet Lord Stern. Now, he was the economist who wrote a big review for the government assessing the economic impacts of climate change. He basically concluded that the UK, the world, needed to take action immediately to avoid devastating consequences. That was 13 years ago. When I said it was extremely worrying in 2006, I probably underestimated. Not probably, I did. Do you think we can achieve it by 2050? We have in our hands different ways of doing electricity, transport, heating. We can now organise our cities in ways that were inconceivable uh, just uh, uh, in 2006. That was one year before the iPhone. So everywhere we look, we can see how to go forward. But it'll involve investment. It'll involve innovation. I think Extinction Rebellion are absolutely right to underline the urgency of this challenge. But net zero is critical. It's not something nice to have. It is an absolute condition for stabilizing temperature. The importance of zero is this, and it's very basic physics. It's the concentrations of the greenhouse gases, CO2 and so on, in the atmosphere that traps the heat. So the higher the concentrations, the more the heat is trapped, and the more temperature rises. Um, but you think 2025 is, is, is too soon? It's not possible by then? I think to go net zero, say, in the UK by 2025 would be extremely difficult. You'd have to get all the internal combustion engine cars off the road. You'd have to get all the gas boilers uh, changed all within five years. That's a pretty hard ask. The government's target of zero, net zero by 2050 uh, makes sense. So I'm enormously optimistic about what you can do. I'm deeply worried about what we will do. Rupert, let's pick up on that. Extremely difficult to achieve what you're proposing by 2025. Yeah. Are you saying that, that people wouldn't be able to drive cars, people wouldn't be able to take flights, um, people would have to get rid of gas boilers? 
extremely difficult. We need a wartime mobilization. We need the kind of thing that we did in 1939, 1940, when everything was turned around on a sixpence, right? Uh, we need to start right now. Mm. And, we, and would, it be those thing, thing, would it be those well, things? Well, let me say this very clearly. The first thing we need to do is stop making things worse. So the question I'd like to put to, over to our Labour and Conservative MPs is, will you agree to stop making things worse? Will you agree right now to stop airport expansion, to cancel HS2, to stop building new roads, and to no. stop prospecting for new fossil fuels? Because no. the longer we well, keep... We're going to fry well, ourselves with the fossil the fuels we've got already. If you had an extra runway at Heathrow, it means that the taxiing of aircraft oh, as they take off let, let him answer. circling no. above... Which is to be fair, that is just trash. That is just trash. The reason they want to build another the reason they want to build another runway out of Heathrow, as you well know, is to have more planes fly in and out. Now, if you're serious about this issue, I'm, you I will mean, agree I'm with not, us I'm to stop to making things worse. At All right. Well, let Jess. You said no too to I, those I, things. I absolutely would not vote for the scrapping of HS2. It has been the single greatest economic benefit to the area that I live, where my children, for example, now say things like, "Oh, well, you know, when I grow up, I want to be like an architect or work in the media." Whereas when I was growing up in Birmingham, you could be a public sector worker or work in uh, factories. And now those industries exist and things in the place where I live. And I have to, I have to, and, and HS2 it, for the environment in the long term is surely... Uh, it, no, the it evidence doesn't off. support that. What we need to be but doing about, is moving to... We need say, to have a Green Rupert, New Deal, Rupert, like Labour said. I understand that you feel very, very passionately. There are things I feel deeply passionate about that I would not give up on. But the reality is, is that how, how can you and I... Because I agree with you. How can you and I get on the same page yeah, where absolutely. my constituents can benefit and so the Green place New deal. where Let's I live at that. the same time as your... We, yeah. need, we need to get on the same page. Absolutely. That's the most important totally thing. Totally agree. Will your approach bring people like Jess and Nigel on board? Look, we're here to tell the truth, right? If other people come on board with it or not, you, you can't negotiate with the atmosphere. The question is, are we going to aim for carbon net zero and stopping biodiversity loss by 2025? Or are we going to make this emergency worse for 10, 20, 30 years? That's what, as long as we haven't achieved net zero, we're making the emergency worse. Right. You're making I mean, it a bit worse by taxis having to go round the roadblocks that you're talking about. Hang on, leave the taxis. Can I, the taxi hang on. Taxi but there, there is an interesting issue here that you've all posed, which is about a challenge to the economy economy and about changing yeah. that economy very dramatically. Where do you stand on that? Well, I, I think that achieving it within such a short time frame would be, you know, incredibly destructive to the economy. It would recall, require a kind of wholesale rethink of the way that we uh, manage wholesale our rethink. lives. That sounds good. <laughs> but it's, it's, you, you need to bring people with you if you're going to implement this kind of stuff. We live in a democracy. And I think some of the tactics of Extinction Rebellion are really starting to annoy people. They're preventing people from going about their livelihoods and so on. I think that there's, there's a danger that they go too extreme and people end up rejecting it all. Whereas mm. what we need is some compromise. We do we need to think about what we can do and also to think of ways that we can do use you know use the market for good carbon taxes carbon capture various forms of technology and extinction rebellion tend to rule out pretty much everything that isn't going back to the stone age Oh, that's such a such but a answer tired point, but old. But answer that point, though. Uh, <laughs> such uh, a tired old line going back to Stony. I mean, really, where do you get these lines? But what, what about we're using about, the market? For example, is a green new deal, right? And what we're about, absolutely, is bringing people with us. That's why we're talking about citizens' assemblies to go back to where we were before. Yes, but we it, want we want to you're, you're bypass using that the tired not, you old want to bypass systems normal democracy. that you are part of. That's the point because people are not going to vote for this in the mainstream. Therefore, you have to come up with some device that allows you to bypass normal forms. But of what democracy. happened in April was that our rebellion transformed public opinion and we're going to transform it still really further possible. over the next two weeks. Two thirds of the British people now saying yes, there is a climate emergency. It doesn't matter whether or not people like us personally. Mm. What matters is if they right start right. to hear our message and start to understand and start to feel those emotions, which can move them to do the, the huge things we need to do if we're going to survive. And they are but huge should, things. We, Will people do, do these things? We need to be. We need to be extremely honest about the trade-offs, not just for Britain, not just what that means for life. You know, slowing down and people doing without so much that they take for granted today, and that might in itself put a lot of people off. Uh, but also what that means for the third world, because, for example, if you clamp down on economic growth in the third world, what that means is that few, more people will die from having to cook over open fires and getting particulates in their young lungs because they'll never get to use electricity. You know, we need to talk about these preventable deaths that will happen because of what is being proposed. The third world, places like Bangladesh and the, the Maldives, which are going underwater right now because of our carbon emissions. For goodness sake, what we're doing is absolutely in solidarity with the developing countries. Do we need to give up? Oh, no. But do we need to give say... up on economic growth? Is that what's needed in order to achieve what you say is absolutely vital? My own view is that it is, but 
all these questions would be put to the Citizens' Assembly. That's the beauty of our proposal, right? All we're saying is, look, here's where we've got to get to. You cannot negotiate with the atmosphere. Let's have a Citizens' Assembly. Let's have the people to decide how we do it.